Okie dokie class, we are going to do a topic such as bones and bone tissue. Now this will vary uh, amongst different uh, books, but it's usually chapter six. <laughs> but uh, that doesn't mean that, but the topic is bones and bone tissue. Uh, so depending on which uh, anatomy book you use here, okay? All right, so some student learning objectives. Uh, evaluate how the functions of bones are related to structure. Critically evaluate the interdependence of different levels of organization, cellular tissue and organs. Predict bone activity and development and repair. Analyze the structure and function of different types of joints, which we'll do in chapter nine. And then describe the function of synovial joints, uh, which we'll do later. So this is all chapter six, seven, eight, nine. So bones, axial, appendicular skeleton, and then joints or articulations. So that uh, is what we'll cover in the next few chapters. Uh, teach you about cartilage, bone classification, and anatomy of bones, ossification, maintaining homeostasis, and promoting bone growth, bone markings, and then what happens as we get older, such as osteoporosis and osteopenia. Now, basically, uh, skeletal system is an organ system with tissues that grow and change throughout life. We have bone, we have cartilage, and ligaments. Now, the best blood supply is, of course, to bone. Then it would be muscles, then tendons, then ligaments and cartilages. Ligaments attach bone to bone, okay? Cartilage is usually found in between the bones, such as articular cartilage, but meniscus is uh, another example. Tendons attach muscle to bone, Okay, and then we have some other connective tissues as well. So we'll go over these. Uh, but the main highlight there is knowing the difference between bones, uh, cartilage, and ligaments. Uh, the worst blood supply is cartilage. This is why if you tear your meniscus, the chance of recovery is slim to none because there's no blood to actually stimulate the healing process. Uh, now cartilage itself is semi-rigid connective tissue. It's weaker than bone. Uh, but more flexible and resilient, right? So it gives us a little bit of flexibility. Bone is not as flexible as cartilage, obviously. Uh, mature cartilage is avascular, meaning no blood supply. This is what I was telling you that, hey, once it's torn, a meniscus, there's no way that it can repair itself because there's no blood supply. Um, so uh, you have cells such as chondroblasts that produce the matrix. Chondrocytes are surrounded by the matrix. So chondro meaning cartilage. Okay. And blast usually means to make, to produce. So osteo, when we talk a little bit later about osteoblasts, they will make bone. They occupy a small space called the lacunae. Lacunae are small little openings. So if you look at the distribution of cartilage, just cartilage itself, okay, we have cartilages in the nose, we have articular cartilage of a joint, we have costal cartilage, we have cartilage uh, in between the discs here, which are discs, uh, pubic symphysis in between the pelvis, you have menisci, articular cartilage, and then the three types of cartilage are hyaline cartilage, which is the most abundant cartilage. Um, the embryonic skeleton is mostly hyal hyaline cartilage. That's why kids can fit through the birth canal because it gives them that flexibility. You have fibrocartilage and then you have elastic cartilage. Um, and you can, when we uh, discuss this a little bit later, you'll know where the fibrocartilage and elastic cartilage is found. Elastic cartilage, mostly in the ear. Fibrocartilage is uh, found in IV discs, pubic symphysis. Okay, so different parts of the body. What's the function of cartilage? Uh, supporting soft tissue. Example include the airways and the respiratory system, the oracle of the ear, uh, providing a gliding surface for the joints. Uh, gives us a model for bone formation. And I'll tell you the two ways that bones are formed. Uh, beginning in the embryo, cartilage grows and then is replaced by bone. So like I was saying, you know, the embryonic <coughs> skeleton is cartilage because it allows for that flexibility to go through the birth canal. If it was one solid mass, uh, the birthing process would be very difficult uh, to say the least. Uh, there's two types of growth. Okay, so there's two types of growth. There's interstitial growth um, that's uh, from within the cartilage 
and then oppositional growth, which is along the cartilage periphery, which is the outside. Okay, so you want to know the difference between interstitial growth, which is from within the cartilage itself, and then oppositional growth, which is on the outside. The, the four major steps of interstitial growth is mitosis of chondrocytes and lacunae. So mitosis, you remember, um, that's what we use for growth and repair. So mitosis is taking one daughter cell and making another. Okay, It forms two chondroblasts per lacunae. Each synthesizes and secretes a new matrix. This separates the cells, which are then called chondrocytes. Cartilage continues to grow as new matrix is produced from within, and there end result is a larger piece of cartilage, newest cartilage being on the inside because going from the inside out. Okay, so that is interstitial growth. Now, oppositional growth, uh, mitosis of stem cells deep within the perichondria, which is at the periphery on the outside. So chondroblast produced matrix become chondrocytes, then lacunae, the result is the larger piece of cartilage, but the newest cartilage is on the outside. Okay, so the, the difference between interstitial and oppositional is oppositional, the newest piece is outside, and interstitial is the newest piece is inside. Inside out versus outside. Okay. So you can see this uh, diagram here so of interstitial growth growing within, and then this you can see on the periphery on the outside. Another example of oppositional growth is as you get uh, uh, older, uh, most uh, most of you will stop growing about 16 to 18 for long bones. Um, your spine will continue to grow until the age of 25. We'll talk about epiphyseal plates. But once you stop growing this way, you can only grow this way. So you can't get any taller. All you can get is wider. Uh, so that's oppositional growth thinking uh, wider. Okay. Uh, bone itself, bones of the skeleton are complex and dynamic organs containing all four tissue types. Uh, primarily bone is connective tissue. Uh, extracellular matrix is sturdy and rigid due to the deposition of minerals, calcification. Why do we have bones? Well, there's a lot of reasons, but support and protection of our delicate organs is the number one thing. Think of the skull, think of the thoracic cage. Again, the thoracic cage is the 24 ribs and the sternum, and then you have the thoracic vertebrae, which is uh, separate there. Uh, hemopoiesis, which is blood cell production, uh, red bone marrow. Uh, it's going to store mineral and energy reserves, uh, calcium and phosphate. And then lipids are stored in yellow bone marrow. So if you like to eat bone marrow, uh, you want to eat the yellow bone marrow, not the red bone marrow. The yellow bone marrow is mostly fat, and we love fat. Okay, uh, calcium and phosphate is important. If you like to eat a lot of, uh, not eat. If you'd like to drink a lot of soda, unfortunately, there is a lot of phosphorus in soda. So when you consume a lot of soda, it disrupts the calcium and phosphorus balance. So what happens is to equalize is the body will leach the calcium from the bones to equalize the phosphorus in the blood, right? So, and I'm, I'm not talking about one soda here and there, but these are people that drink two, three liters uh, a day. And you're like, oh, that's a lot. Yeah, well, there's patients out there um, that drink a lot of soda in one day, okay? Uh, long bones, here are my long bones, greater length than width, my upper and lower limbs. Uh, short bones, they're in my wrist, carpal bones, and tarsals. Uh, flat bones, uh, thin flat surfaces, roof of skull, sternum is flat. And then we have irregular bones, which are the vertebrae. So here's some examples of the flat bone, irregular bone, the long bone, and the short bones. Now you do want to know uh, the anatomy, the gross anatomy of long bones. We call uh, the elongated shaft is the diaphyses, okay? And the epiphyses is the knobby and large regions at each end, uh, proximal epiphyses and distal epiphyses. Uh, that strengthens the joints. It's also the attachment site uh, for tendons and ligaments. Now the metaphysis uh, is the region between the diaphysis and the epiphysis, and that is where our growth plate is. So remember I was telling you that um, most long bones stop growing around 16 to 18. 
which is about right. So you're you're gonna pretty much be as tall as you're gonna be around 16 to 18. 16 for females, 18 for males. But your spine will continue to grow because the epiphyseal plate in the spine doesn't close till 25. So if you're under 25, you you have a chance to grow. I mean, you're not gonna grow from 5'1 to 6'1, but you might grow from 5'1 to 5'1 and a half, maybe 5'2 if you're lucky, right? So. Articular cartilage is a thin layer of hyaline cartilage recovering, uh, covering the epiphyses, uh, reduces friction and absorbs shock in the movable joint. So when uh, people say they're bone on bone, well, the articular cartilage has pretty much uh, uh, worn out. And once, remember, cartilage has no blood supply, mature cartilage. Uh, so once it's gone, it's gone. So a lot of times uh, patients have to have a total knee or total hip replacement once their articular cartilage, the cushioning is gone. Uh, the medullary cavity, uh, the hollow cylindrical space in the diaphysis, uh, it contains uh, yellow bone marrow, which is the fat that we like. So here's uh, the anterior view of a femur. Okay, if you were to cut that out. Again, here's the proximal epiphyses. There's the metaphysis, which is where the growth plate is found. Here's the diaphysis. Again, here's the metaphysis. And to the, so fractures along the metaphysis, which is here, which is, uh, we don't like that, right? Because if the growth plate is injured, then it can, you can be, uh, you can have one leg shorter than the other, one arm shorter than the other. Uh, so growth plate injuries or fractures are very difficult uh, to treat and we have to be very careful. Um, Now, if you look at uh, the long bone itself, again, there are, it does have some layers, which is the endosteum, the periosteum. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in the next few slides here. Uh, but kind of make sure you know the gross anatomy of the long bone. All right. Okay. Um, so the layers of the long bones, uh, the endosteum covers most internal surfaces of the bones. This contains osteoprogenetic cells, which are our stem cells. I'll talk about those in a little bit. Osteoblasts and osteoclasts. Uh, these are active in bone remodeling, growth, and fracture repair. The periosteum, which is the covers the external surfaces of the bones, um, except where articular cartilage does, right? So if you have articular cartilage, you don't have a periosteum. Periosteum is uh, found uh, in different areas. It's mostly dense irregular connective tissue. Uh, attached by perforating fibers, okay, embedded within the bone metrics. Um, they act as an anchor for blood vessels and nerves. And again, it contains osteoprogenic cells, which are stem cells, and osteoblasts. They're active in remodeling, growth, and fracture repair. Okay, so make sure you know the difference between the endosteum and the periosteum. Uh, one is on the inside, and the periosteum is on the outside. So here you can see this, here's the periosteum, okay? And then the endosteum is inside. And I'm gonna talk about these three cells, uh, the osteoblast, osteoclast, and osteoprogenic cells uh, within the next few slides. There you go. So the osteoprogenic cells, uh, they're mesenchymal stem cells in endosteum and periosteum can produce more stem cells or osteoblasts. Remember, stem cells are cells that haven't decided what they want to be when they grow up. Uh, so so we, li we like stem cells because they can um, uh, turn into other cells and help us. Osteoblasts form bone matrix. So they secrete as organic osteoids, so they're going to make bone. Osteocytes reside in the lacunae, that small little opening, and they maintain matrix and detect mechanical stress on a bone. Osteoclasts, uh, they're large multinuclear cells that dissolve bone matrix, uh, bone resorption, releasing calcium. They have a ruffled border, often located in a resorption lacunae. They, sec they secrete hydrochloric acid and enzymes that dissolve the matrix. Um, the release of stored calcium and phosphate from bone is called osteolysis. So let's put this in perspective. When you're a baby, right, you need to build bone, build bone, build bone. So osteoblasts are going crazy. Boom, 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 boom. As an adult right now, uh, to maintain bone, you're mostly osteocytes. Uh, and then unfortunately, as you get older, Osteoclasts sometimes will outpace osteoblasts, so you get more bone destruction than you're making. Uh, osteoporosis is basically osteoclast activity outpacing osteoblast activity. And uh, 
Caucasian women and Asian women are more susceptible to osteopenia and osteoporosis. So we like to promote them with weight-bearing exercises such as walking, resistance training, um, uh, lifting weights. Uh, swimming and bicycle is not really good for osteoporosis because it's not going to stimulate bone growth. We want them to do weight-bearing exercises such as walking uh, for treatment of osteoporosis. Uh, types of cells in bone connective tissue. Again, here's the osteoprogenic cells. Uh, think of those as stem cells. You have the osteoblast, which forms bone matrix. Um, and then some osteoblasts will do, uh, turn into osteocytes, which will help maintain our bone matrix. Uh, so as an adult, you have uh, quite a few osteocytes because they're maintaining. Now you're thinking, well, why do we need osteoclast to break down? Well, we don't want to make too much. Um, when you're making too much uh, bone, you can get something called uh, acromegaly, uh, which is you'll see in um, some WWE wrestlers, uh, Andre the Giant, the Great Kali, Triple H. These are seven six sound for you. If you look at their jawline, they're uh, it's a over hypersecretion of uh, the growth hormone, and it causes their bones and osteoblasts are deposited at a, a higher rate. Dep composition of bone matrix, um, organic components of bone, about one third of bone mass. You have cells, you have collagen fibers, and you have ground substance. The inorganic components of the matrix, uh, primarily hydroxyapatite, uh, which is calcium phosphate and calcium hydroxide, um, and provides compressional strength. Okay, so compressional strength here versus tensile strength, stretching twisting versus compression. So bone is very resistant, right? So you can push it, you can twist it, you can turn it. Think about when you run, when you're throwing, uh, all the things that you're uh, you're doing, you don't get a fracture that easily. Uh, a fracture, you know, we'll discuss a little bit later. It's got to be the right timing, the right angle at the right uh, strength. But your bone is pretty strong, right? I mean, it's got compression and tensile strength. So for you to break bone, uh, uh, it's very unfortunate. Uh, and the timing's got to be right and the event um, or the fall has to be just right. Uh, the two different things that you want to know, we have compact bone, which is solid and relatively dense, so it gives us strength, stability. Uh, but you have a spongy bone, which is the open lattice of narrow uh, plates called trabeculae. Uh, there's, those are the internal surfaces of the bones, but it gives us that flexibility. So our bones are not solid mass. If they were a solid mass, it'd be very difficult to even move your arm or move, uh, but they're not all spongy, otherwise you'd be too fragile. So it's a combination of both of compact and spongy bone that gives us strength, flexibility, protection. So here, if you can see the outlook, so if you look at compact bone, which is the outside, right, it's nice. And then the spongy bone, which is the inside, which gives us a little bit of flexibility. So think of a sandwich, right? You've got the, the bread and then the, uh, the ingredients inside. And the bread is like the protective for all the stuff inside. The basic unit of compact bone is called the osteon right here. There's, that's the basic unit, also known as the haversion system. Uh, they're basically cylindrical structures. If you ever look at the annular rings of trees, you know how they're, uh, um, each ring represents a year of growth, uh, but that gives the, the, the tree stability. Um, so again, bone itself, the way that the concentric lamellae uh, and the circumferential lamellae are, it gives it a nice uh, framework for stability. So it's designed with a purpose. If you look at compact bone, the osteon itself, you have a central canal, which has a nerve, a artery, and a vein. You have concentric lamellae, like I was telling you, rings of a bone around the central canal that gives it its strength. You have osteocytes. You just learned about osteocytes and what they do, and they maintain the bone. And then caniculi, cannel, tiny interconnecting channels that extend between the lacunae. So you have these small little caniculi Okay, they allow osteocytes to connect and communicate and say, hey, what are you doing? Oh, I'm making more bone. All right, I guess I'll make more bone. So they're talking to each other here. Okay, they look like little spiders. Uh, but that's an osteocyte. And lacunae is where they sit. Lacunae is a small little opening.
and this caniculi allows communication between the different osteocytes. You have perforating canals that run perpendicular uh, to help and connect multiple central canals. So if I have two canals here, I'm going to have a perforating canal that will connect those two. Uh, basically, they allow passage for blood vessels and nerves. Uh, again, you have circumferential lamellae, which is rings of bone immediately internal to the periosteum. Um, they run the entire circumference of the bone to give it stability. And then you have interstitial lamellae, uh, leftover parts of the osteons that have been partially reabsorbed. Um, oops, oops. Uh, spongy bone, uh, microscopic anatomy, there are no osteons in spongy bone. Uh, trabeculae contain parallel lamellae. It's a network of trabeculae that provides resistance to stress applied in many directions. So again, that gives us that flexibility uh, that I was telling you about. Okay. But you have osteoblasts on the outside here. You have no osteons in spongy bone. Osteons are found in compact bone. So there's the components of bone. We're looking at that. Here's the microscopic anatomy. So if you're in lab, you've looked at the histology of bone. Now let's look at some terminology. We have uh, ossification, which is osteogenesis, is the formation and development of bone connected tissue. You have two patterns. You have intramembranous uh, ossification and you have endochondral ossification. So intramembranous uh, uh, develops from the mesenchyme. Uh, it produces uh, bones of the skull, some facial muscles, our mandible, and the clavicle. But the rest of the body is through endochondral ossification. So it begins with hyaline cartilage, and then it develops from that. So if I were to ask you the difference between endomembranous and endochondral, you want to know that most of the bones in the body, uh, such as the upper and lower limbs, are made with uh, endochondral ossification, which the hyaline cartilage serves as the model, and then we grow into hard bone uh, afterwards. So here's intramembranous ossification. Uh, form within thickened regions of the mesenchyme. So here's our mesenchymal cells. Here's the ossification, osteoblasts. Remember, they make bone. Uh, so again, remember we were talking about the, the little baby skull. Uh, that's hyaline uh, cartilage. And then the, the thickened regions of the mesenchyme, which are found right here. Okay. So ossification centers form within thickened regions of the mesenchyme. So right around here. So the osteoid undergoes uh, calcification. And then woven bone and surrounding periosteum form. Mesenchyme condensing form the periosteum. The laminar bone replaces woven bone as compact bone and spongy bone form. So that is basically intramembrous from within. Intra within the membrane. Now endochondral, which is all the other bones, the fetal hyaline cartilage model develops. So again, remember I was telling you, most of the baby is hyaline cartilage, which is the most abundant tissue. So if I were to ask you on this week's quiz, what's the most abundant, uh, that's hyaline cartilage. Uh, the cartilage calcifies and the periosteal bone collar forms. Uh, the primary ossification is the diaphyses, which is the shaft. The secondary ossification is from the epiphyses. Bone will replace the cartilage, uh, except for, again, the articular cartilage and the epiphyseal plates. Uh, epiphyseal plates ossify, and they'll form the epiphyseal line. Okay, so that's remnants of the growth plate. All, most of your epiphyseal uh, growth plates will ossify by age 16 to 18. So here is the endochondral ossification. So here's the hyaline uh, cartilage model. Then you start to get a deteriorating cartilage matrix. So the cartilage is starting to go away and we are starting to uh, make more bone. And then as we lay it down, we're gonna deposit more bone right through here. And that is our growth plate, 
which is the epiphyseal plates or your loin more so you're getting longer longer um, if you ever had growing pains right so the growing pains can occur because you're getting longer and longer here when these shut then you no longer grow this way then you can only grow this way which is oppositional growth okay so this is a good summary of how bone is formed in the endochondral ossification okay from the highland cartilage model most bone forms this way uh, epiphyseal plate uh, morphology the epiphyseal plate is a layer of highland cartilage at the boundary of the epiphyses and diaphyses site of interstitial growth uh, there's five distinct uh, zones uh, zone of resting cartilage zone of proliferating cartilage zone of hypertrophic cartilage zone of calcified cartilage and zone of ossification um, you can look at what's happening at each one at the resting cartilage furthest from the medullary cavity and nearest the epiphyses small chondrocytes in highland cartilage zone of proliferating cartilage larger chondrocytes undergoing rapid mitosis cell division aligned like stacks of coins Zone of hypertrophic cartilage, chondrocytes seize dividing and become enlarged. Zone of calcified cartilage, deposit minerals kill the chondrocytes and make matrix opaque. And the zone of ossification, the walls between the lacunae break down, forming channels that become invaded with capillaries and stem cells, osteoprogenic cells. So here are the zones, see, zone one, zone two, zone three, zone four, and zone five. If you were to look at this x-ray, you can tell that it's a little child because most bones haven't fully developed here and you can still see the growth plate here. Once the, uh, an adult, you won't see these growth plates, you'll see them just as lines. Okay, so you can see the growth plates here as well. Here's the diaphyses. Okay. Here's the diaphyses with the shaft and the epiphyses, which are the ends. Uh, growth of bone itself, uh, long bones growth and length is referred to as interstitial growth, occurs in the epiphyseal plate. Growth in the bone's diameter, getting bigger, is referred to as oppositional growth. So for the quiz, make sure you know the difference between interstitial and oppositional growth. Occurs in the periosteum. Osteoblasts lay down external circumferential lamellae and osteoclasts enlarge medullary cavity from within bone. Here is oppositional growth as an infant, as a child, as a young adult, and then an adult. So you can see the difference there. You're getting bigger, 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 and bigger. All right, bone remodeling, continual production of new bone and resorption of old bone is called bone remodeling. You make new bone, you got to get rid of old bone, right? It's constant. Helps maintain the calcium and phosphate levels. Like I told you, if you like to drink too much soda, your phosphorus levels goes up. So I need to balance that out. I am going to leach the calcium from my bones to balance it out. So soda in general is bad, bad, bad. Uh, although a lot of you like Dr. Pepper. I don't know how you like Dr. Pepper. That thing tastes like cough syrup to me. But people love Dr. Pepper. I don't know what it is. Um, but it is what it is. Um, occurs at different rates at different places in the body. All right, the blood supply. Remember, bone is highly vascularized. So if you've ever broken a bone, you know that within six to eight weeks, you're, you're pretty much healed. Um, now if you have a severe fracture, you might need some screws and plates. Uh, but a normal bone, uh, depending on the extent of uh, the fracture, it can pretty much heal on its own due to the blood supply. A typical long bone has four major sets of blood vessels. You have the nutrient artery and vein, you have the metaphyseal arteries and vein, you have the epiphyseal artery and vein, and the periosteal. So they just are named for where they uh, supply the blood. Okay. Uh, when we do blood vessels, you'll know, hey, I have a radial artery, I have an ulnar artery, once you know that here's the radius and the ulna. So they're named for usually where they supply the blood. You can look at the vast blood supply in bone and hence why it can heal very quickly. Maintaining homeostasis and promoting bone growth. 
um, growth, maintenance, repair, upon hormones, vitamins, and exercise. Exercise, exercise, exercise. Uh, the body says, if I'm going to exercise, I'm going to lay down more uh, bone. This is why uh, with osteoporosis, we want them to walk, walk, and lift weights. If the brain says, I'm putting stress on my bone, I am going to make more bone. Okay? This is why swimming is not because you're not putting stress on it. Now, someone that has osteoarthritis, where they're bone on bone and walking hurts, then the pool or swimming makes sense. But if someone we're trying to promote bone growth, we want them to walk, walk, walk. Uh, the effects of hormones, uh, well, definitely hormones are going to uh, affect and regulate osteoblast and osteoclast activity. For women in general, once they reach menopause, estrogen production is going to go down. And once estrogen production keeps going down, it can uh, influence the parathyroid, the thyroid hormones, and the calcium balance. Okay, so cartilage growth hormone and insulite growth factors stimulate cartilage growth. The thyroid hormone stimulates metabolic rate of osteoblast, thereby stimulating bone growth. Uh, calcitonin and parathyroid hormone have opposite effects on calcium. Now, calcitonin, calcitonin promotes calcium deposit, whereas parathyroid hormone stimulates osteoclast to reabsorb. So you need a balance of both. Um, but um, if I have a dysfunction and osteoclast, the parathyroid hormone, secretes too much, then I'm going to break down more bone than I'm making, hence osteoporosis. Okay, so sex hormones such as estrogen and testosterone secreted in large amounts at puberty uh, greatly accelerate bone growth. So if my estrogen levels go down during menopause, then I'm not going to have bone growth and my osteoclasts are breaking down more bone, that can lead to osteoporosis. Vitamins we need are Vitamins A, C, and D. Vitamin A activates osteoblasts. Vitamin C required for collagen synthesis. Vitamin D stimulates calcium absorption from GI tract into the blood. Mechanical stress stimulates uh, increase in bone density by increased osteoblast activity. Bones of athletes become thicker and stronger as a result of repetitive and stressful exercise. Bone loss mass with age, but this can be slowed or reversed with weight bearing exercise such as walking. All right, let's start fractures uh, on a new one.